So for those who might not know you, can you introduce yourself and sort of go through your own history with the sport and how you ended up at ASU? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like like the podcast probably introduces, I'm Grant House. Uh, I am I come from uh, Indiana. I grew up there for 15 years in a small southeastern town called Bright, Indiana. Uh, for anyone who's big into skiing and snowboarding, um, by perfect north slopes, basically. Oh, you've, you've cut out there. My dad were both oh, wait, there swim coaches. Uh, my mom and dad were both swim coaches. Uh, and my brother and sister also swam in college and throughout their lives as well. So my, uh, my sister swam in northern Ohio for college. Uh, and then my brother swam at Purdue University and Charlotte, North Carolina in Division II. Um, and that was kind of like my exposure to swimming. You know, everyone in my, in my family was swimmers. Um, I grew up uh, by the poolside in the crib. Um, so it was just kind of always, always there, you know, I played, um, some basketball growing up a little, uh, something like summer league camps every, every year, um, did water polo for five years, eighth grade through senior year. Uh, uncle taught me lacrosse, played that a little bit and, uh, really just always stayed active with other sports because of my brother and my, my dad and my cousins, especially. So. I was always like pretty athletically active. It was always what I enjoyed the most. It was always what I was spending the, the entire summer doing. And um, at the age of 15, I decided to, my family and I decided we wanted to go to uh, St. Xavier uh, High School in Cincinnati, Ohio, a pretty prominent athletic school and a pretty prestigious academic school as well with a really, really renowned um, swimming legacy there. Uh, so my three of my uncles had actually gone there as well, which not too many people actually know. Um, but that was kind of like the biggest segue into to going there. Um, so that was exciting. That was a really big shift in my trajectory into my career and my overall development. I think it was probably the most formative four years I've, I've experienced thus far in my life um, and really set the platform for the rest, of my, the rest of my existence, the rest of my life, and especially coming to college to really give me the foundation, the structure to you know, perform and make the right decisions and, and be a more responsible and mature adult. But um, from there, I, you know, I, I never was really looking at Arizona State. Um, I, I never really thought to my freshman, sophomore, um, even even my more so my junior year, I, I kind of started thinking about it. Uh, I got contacted by Coach Bowman, and uh, that's that's kind of when it first started happening. You know, I'd, I'd heard like he moved out there, but I didn't really know much about Arizona State. Um, when my brother was being recruited in 2007, we'd actually taken a trip down to Arizona as a family to see Grand Canyon University, primarily University of Arizona, and she at the time, but that was more of a, a trip on the, on the way. And so I'd actually been to Arizona State with my brother being recruited there, which is kind of a nice, neat little tie-in, um, but never really had it on the on the radar because I mean in 07, 08 the program as a whole was actually cut um, so there was no swimming team. Oh, I didn't building. know that actually. Yeah yeah the Arizona State swimming team was actually cut completely for a little bit so there was actually a, a brief a brief moment in time where the, it did not exist um, so fortunately we have such a renowned such a like successful and, and prominent alumni supportive group um, and they they push forward to bring the bring the program back on their own funds and uh, fortunate for me, it's it, it, that lasted and that uh, that continued on and rolled forward. And uh, you know, after talking with Coach Bowman uh, quite a bit and the coaching staff here at the time, um, it's evolved and changed and improved drastically, exponentially. I'd say in my mind since I first was talking um, and had some coaching turnover. But I uh, I think it's only been for the better and uh, for drastic improvement. So um, I I wanted to come out here. You know, it was a, a decision between. ASU and some other pretty renowned schools in the country. Um, fortunately, I was in that position, and uh, you know it, it came down to pretty much for me Texas and, and ASU. And you know Texas has a very renowned history as well, similar in nature to kind of my decision to go to St. X. And I was like, you know, I've already made that decision. I, I, I once before, and uh, it was a great decision. Um, but this time, I want to kind of go a different path. I want I want to make a decision to to really create something to, to be a part of a, of, of a building process to have that that vigor that intensity every day of coming in to have a goal and a mission and I'm sure the guys at Texas and and at Cal and Florida have 
have their own ways of looking at it too, but it's uh, it's different when you've been at the top for a long time and a long period of time. Um, and it's, it's a different journey and it's a different pursuit that's, I feel, much more empowering, much more invigorating, um, and much more um, prideful at the end when you hopefully, ideally, get to see the fruits of your labor, see the, the payoff come at the end, the dividends being paid. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're starting starting to get a glimpse of that, and I think the rest of the world is, and I think the rest of the world is uh, is liking what they're seeing and, and pretty shocked by it, too, I'd say, to say the least. But, you know, when I came out here, it was, frankly, like a, a pretty big risk I, I wanted to take, I was excited to take, but no one, uh, I, I was just talking to the, uh, competing with the, the freshmen at a practice on Friday morning. And they were talking about, they were like, hey, Grant, when I was like 12, you were starting college. Isn't that crazy? And I was like, awesome. Thanks, guys. But we did, we did like 100. And then I got back and I was like, dude, none of you guys six years ago were, even knew Arizona State existed. And like a resounding yes came over the lanes across from me, all freshmen. And uh, that, that, that was, that, that's the goal. Like, and that, that was one of the goals. And that's one of the parts of the mission. Um, coming here and making a decision to turn this into a program that everyone in the household of every swimming family says, I want to go there. I want to be a Sun Devil. And that's a huge reason why I wanted to come out here. And Coach Bowman and I shared that same vision. Um, Coach uh, Herbie Bain, uh, he was a former alumni at Arizona State as well. And to come back and be a coach, he um, exponentially shares that same vision too. So it's a, it's a great um Great trifecta kind of force we have going there that we've always we've always had since uh, the three of us have come together and definitely definitely pushing forward until the ultimate goal of a national championship is is uh, crowned and accomplished. I think that's that's the highest a team can perform um, in the college realm of things outside individual performances of like American records, improvement, um, and all the other intangible and tangible aspects that go into it. But as a whole group. We really preach team over self, and that's the highest uh, accomplishment our team can get because we've already re-read, re rebroken and rewrote and rewritten our record board dozens of times now in the last <laughs> few years. Um, I think since the start of the season in 2021, Herbie said we broke 68 uh, oh, wow. records just on the men's side, um, and I know we set – the, I know we said like the, the IM records at least three times over between midseason packs and um, NCAAs. Uh, so that was pretty pretty uh, astounding, pretty phenomenal and very exciting. So um, we're definitely in the right trajectory within our team, and uh, we're just going to stay on that path. So long-winded answer maybe, but uh, – A good one though. It, yeah, it's been a long journey. It's been a long couple years here and uh, a long path to get to this point. So I think it deserves that. There was um there was an article I was reading and it had a very I think accurate title. It was it was on Swim Swam when they're like ranking all their like the college teams for the incoming season, and they put ASU men put the nation on notice. And I, yeah. I like that title. Yeah, uh, it's uh, very very accurate. I think uh, I think some of the team had seen that. I actually hadn't seen that. I, I I haven't seen that article yet. I guess I should say, but I hadn't seen that. Um, there was like kind of some references to that the next day uh and whatnot and like we always kind of have some fun with some of the comments in here and there because <laughs> everyone just loves to bash on asu i think because everyone's trying to figure out what we're doing that's making us uh, improve at such an exponential rate and kind of like why why the bottom of the bottom of the group has has moved up so far to be beating these guys at the top so I think it's a little animosity, uh, maybe a little jealousy, but also a little um, scared, scared, fear, fearful of it, but also some curiosity too. But yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's definitely been a, a process in the working, but I think uh, I think most of the world's on notice at, at this point, not just the nation. I um, so building off of that, within like the last couple of weeks, there's been a large number of big names in the sport who've made the transition down there to ASU. So, I mean, other than being able to train with Bob Bowman, who's a, you know, he's coached a couple of good athletes. Yeah. There's a, a couple of people who've made some noise in swimming. Um, what do you think has led to this many high-profile athletes, like, flocking to the school? But I mean, you, you've touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if there's anything else you can say about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think Phoenix, Tempe, especially, is just a phenomenal place to be. Um, you know, I always, I, I got the biggest realizations from this, um, I think, in retrospect, when I was a freshman, sophomore, and some of my days would be a little bit longer. We had a different schedule at that point. Um, and so some of my days would have three sessions of training and then one and then two or then one. Um, and so most of the time now it's just like two each day. Um, and some of those days would have me like my major would ASU is a very big school. So I would have me going downtown for the health solutions college. Um, so I'd have to go downtown, which is 15 minutes away, take my classes, come back. Um, maybe like have a, I'd have a morning practice, then lunch, go, go downtown, take my classes, come back afternoon practice, then homework, um, and so on and so forth, kind of repetitive notion, but uh, there was th there's a huge aspect, especially a guy coming from Midwest and in Ohio being uh, or in high school being in Ohio, where the days were just very gray, very gloomy, a lot of overcast. And it was just like that for weeks on end. Um, it wasn't really too big of an extreme one way or the other. Uh, it was just kind of this moderate, like even gloom uh, for quite a few days at a time. And that kind of like wears on you after a while, like you might not notice it, but it really does. And there's certain moments being out in Arizona um, where there's not a cloud in sight. Uh, there's not a, a, a shadow in, in view and it's just crystal clear skies, the sun shining, you're in water, the best, best place to be in Arizona in the desert. Um, <laughs> you've got palm trees. I don't really understand how that's possible out here, but we've got palm <laughs> trees out here and you're walking around and you're like, am I on a resort? Like what, like what is going on? And, uh, like I just finished two exams. I'm pretty tired, pretty stressed, pretty fatigued. I'm I hop in the water and I'm like, I'm just, I'm just like swimming in paradise, like 365 days out here. Like who, who else gets to do that? Like not Michigan, like they're going, they're like <laughs> training, they're swimming indoors at, at, at 6 a.m. in the morning. They don't get to see the sunrise. They're having to deal with like snow um, and other, other schools too. Like it, it's just, it's just, that's, those were factors that I, I considered when I was going to uh, colleges is like what I wanted to consider when the moments were like at its hardest. And, you know, when you get to practice at 2 p.m. and it's 80 degrees in December, you know, it makes makes practice a little bit more manageable when you're finishing 10 200s IM or, or finishing an all out set or off the blocks. Like it makes life a lot more approachable, manageable, and it makes all the training a lot better. And I think a lot of people have realized that. Um, I think a lot of people have seen that and experienced it now that have gone to, you know, those those colleges, university club programs that are kind of predominantly indoors, which coming from the Midwest and most of the U.S., it, it largely is. I don't I only know of one indoor facility in all of Arizona that I've ever been to, which is wild for me to say. But um, it's it's unique and it's special to the state, too. And not a lot of places have that. So um, I think that's an aspect, too, is it's just your quality of life. Uh, I always talk to Ryan Held about it, and he'll he'll preach about it as well. It's just coming to practice every day is much more enjoyable. Going throughout your day is much much more manageable, and just the overall environment here um, is very welcoming. Uh, the the ASU community is very welcoming with open arms and very supportive and, and helpful of all the initiatives. And our athletic director, you know, he's 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 spoken out and openly stated that he wants us to be an Olympic Olympic mecca for athletes. Um, and I think Bob and uh, Bob, especially being one of the foundational pieces of that um, and Herbie now too, um, just resonate that and echo that very loudly um, so that the world and the, the nation is starting to notice that as well. So it's very exciting. And I, I think it goes just beyond, it goes far beyond just the, what we're doing in the pool, the two to four hours a day. Um, and it, it echoes a lot on the community and, and a lot of the aspects of what we're doing, you know, to get into the pool, around the pool with each other and uh, outside of training. I think it's definitely going to be really exciting to see this over the next couple of years where where the team can go as a whole. Because there's been definitely a lot of publicity this year, but there's also been swims to back up that publicity. Yeah. Or at least, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, that's like that's the biggest thing too. Is is I mean, people you can't like swimming's a data driven sport, or it should be. It's not not yeah. completely yet, but it's an objective sport, and it's hard to ignore the improvements that 
the the top end women and the, and all the men are having like at this program like it, it it's just facts and so when any elite level athlete that we're seeing on the men's and women's side that are coming to join our pros it's like okay like men and women are getting faster and performing at the highest stages in the world at Arizona State and you can't ignore that it's it's hard to ignore when a guy goes one thirty seven in the two hundred am yeah 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 it's uh yeah it's it's pretty uh pretty hard to ignore that or when he's a <laughs> <laughs> Two-time world champion uh, yeah. at his first world championships. Almost breaks a world record that's been around since I was seven. <laughs> yeah, and I think the coolest thing was is like myself and others like that was the expectation. Like everyone was like, "Oh my god, she went this time!" And I was like, going into the event, I was like, four oh four nine, four oh five, like two. Like that's where I was thinking that he would be at. Yeah. And that's just because I see it every day. Like that, I I get to train with it every day, and we get to compete against each other every day. He hates when I beat him, and I hate when I he, he beat me. <laughs> and that's what makes us uh, so successful in our own ways. But, yeah, I mean, that's, like, the coolest thing is to see the world be kind of surprised by that. But, you know, several of us were like, yeah, that's that's Leon. He's definitely been – it's been fantastic seeing him and a lot of the other athletes, including you at ASU, like, seeing what you guys have been able to accomplish. Um, so – Jumping back a couple years, obviously, COVID brought around a lot of uncertainty for everybody. And I'm curious if you can talk about, because you had initially made the decision to redshirt that 2019 to 2020 season. So yeah. I'm curious if you can talk about if there was any, I, I guess regret is the wrong word, but it's the best word I can think of. If there was any regret after, you know, everything shut down and everybody was at home. Yeah, no, I, I definitely don't think there's uh, there's any regret on my point. I think if anything, I just looked like a mad genius to everyone else because <laughs> I kind of I kind of lucked out. Um, I had made the decision to take an Olympic waiver in, in the in the fall of '19 after I went to the Pan American Games and World University Games, um, and try to really set myself up as best I could for the Olympic trials and making the team. Um, and so, lo and behold, little did any of us know, COVID would come around. Um, and so since I was sitting out that year academically and athletically, um, I was not affected when they canceled NCAAs uh, that last year. And so the frustrating part was watching my friends and my peers across the country, especially at ASU, you know, suffer with that um, because the way swimming works is uh, the pretty much like obviously the 99% of the season was completed except for the final stop, NCAAs, and the final 10% of the season is what – largely matters most as to how like teams are ranked and uh, uh, at least uh, appearance wise on the outside looking in how people perceive them as national champions sixth fourth fifth what have you um so and no one really got to show their cards or really perform that year um and so being on the outside looking in kind of training here still um asu had had a phenomenal pack 12s that year um uh, without myself competing um, and the team really evolving with our underclassmen like Jack Dolan, Julian Hill, Andrew Gray, uh, Carter Swift, and uh, upperclassmen at that point too, Evan Carlson, Cody Bybee, um, and, and a couple others. They had done phenomenal at Pac-12 conferences, started rewriting our record board there, um, and uh, I think beating every relay record. Uh, and then the, that was kind of like our own little conference conference action. We knew what happened, uh, but NCAA is where everyone would see it. Uh, on a bigger stage, never happened. So we kind of kind of died down. Like no one kind of saw the explosion happen. It kind of got muffled up. Um, and so we go through that summer um, and there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of uh, decisions to be made. And Coach Bowman and the coaching staff elected to make the red shirt year um, just because up until February, um, based on my understanding is no conference, no athlete even knew if NCAAs was gonna happen in March. Up to up, up and all the way up until February. So on that regard, I think our decision was great. I I, I think my uh, my luck, I guess we'll say it had that. I my decision was a strong one, obviously with the Olympic lead in, and the uh, the red shirt was a phenomenal year to develop our team to to figure things out on our team and to have everyone mature and develop another year and to to help us learn. And you know, I think that's why. The, the improvement or the uprise, if you want to say, from ASU was so shocking, per se, to some people um, because it had been almost two years since we'd gotten a chance to do that. So it was like, 
okay, last time we were here, we got whatever it was, 24th or something. And then we go to sixth and it's like, oh my gosh. But it's like, no, like we were improving those two years. Like we, we saw these coming, like ask, ask Herbie. He has all the Excel sheets to show us all the times <laughs> and everything. Like, and, uh, and I'm sure Bob knew all, like Bob could tell you the same thing too, like what we were doing in practice. And so I know for me in 2020, like, um, I actually fractured two of my ribs in training in 2019. Um, so I had to withdraw from two competitions and then winter nationals was pretty abysmal. Um, I had a pro series in January that was pretty abysmal. And then I actually ended up training, switching my training to be with, uh, coach Herbie and, uh, and, uh, being with Herbie was uh, pretty phenomenal. Definitely a drastic change, uh, going from Bob's group to, um, much lower quantity and high, like higher emphasis on quality and, and intensity. Um, and that went really well leading into a March pro series and then everything shut down. Um, and then when we kind of re re upped with everything, we decided to keep on that trend, um, through 21 to 22 leading into trials. And, uh, I think definitely if trials had come along in 2020, I would have done a lot worse. Uh, than I had in 2021. So I was grateful for the extra time, the extra break. Um, <clears throat> I actually took 14 weeks off in 2020 because I couldn't access a pool. And I was I about to that... ask you how long actually. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that was, uh, yeah, it was 14 weeks. Everything was closed down out here and uh, couldn't access anything. And I think it just gave me a time to recover and repair everything. So you, you kind of partially answered a question I was about to ask you, but um, so talking about those delayed Olympic trials, it skewered plans for pretty much everybody. Yeah. Um, but it also gave an extra year of development to a lot of athletes. And mm -hmm. as a result of that, this this number might be wrong, but from, from what I could find, about 34 of the eventual 49 athletes on the team were it was their first Olympic, some of them their first like senior championships ever. So you, you've spoken about how it affected you personally that you got an extra year and it sounds like it was a good thing considering how the fall 2019 and early 2020 went. But I'm curious as to what's your take on how the extra year delay affected the final roster of the team. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a sword with two ends to it, two sides to it. I think it gave um, different people an extra year to develop and mature and figure things out, um, and I think it also impacted uh, the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> you know, the people who were kind of in that limbo after the first COVID wave of uh, you know I, I'm a senior, I just lost my eligibility, I can't go back to college. I'm pretty like on the top end of swimming, but like not maybe good enough to be a professional like in, in making money and sponsorships all the time um, and trying to figure out how I fit in there. And so the biggest thing that I feel like it comes down to was just how we managed ourselves during that, how we were able to adapt and evolve. Um, and I think some people were able to better than others. You know, I think some people in the NCAA category, it's, it fits very well, you know, freshman to senior, four years, the quadrennial plan, four years. And so when you have to make a plan B, it was really hard for people to adapt and change their plans. I mean, that, that's like, if you have a, if you're a senior, you're in your fourth year and your fourth year is going to lead into that summer and it's going to be Olympic trials, you're probably going to be, and you're, and you're hoping to make the team or you're in line to make the team, either one, either way, like you're most likely possibly going to be, probably going to be done with swimming after that. So people probably have jobs lined up. People probably have internships that summer maybe or starting after Olympic trials, the next chapter of their lives starting. And so when that basically says like, okay, we're going to take a pause for this, it's kind of hard to tell an employer like, hey, no, I have to, I need, I need a little bit more time to just go and swim in a pool real quick. Like just, just <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me do a couple laps and then I'll, I'll be back, I swear. Um, <laughs> And it's like, nope, we're making billions upon tr and trillions of dollars. Like, no, we're not going to listen to some, one person when we can just fill it with another per like another employee. And so I think that like tugging back and forth for a lot of the like graduating athletes is really tough. Um, a lot of older athletes too, trying to finish their careers and start another chapter, putting things on hold for another year, incredibly difficult. 
Um, and I, I definitely have a, like a sincere, like, um, sincere, uh, for feel, like feelings and, and in support to those athletes that had to kind of, kind of were like forced to move on almost, um, and start the next chapters, like kind of out of schedule, but it was just, uh, just the way things happened. And I think that was the biggest thing. I think a lot of the athletes who maybe had to move on that were ending their careers, um, could have made the team. I think it was more of like just an aspect of how feasible is this and is it possible financially? Like the swimming is not the most lucrative sport and uh, how, how it was able to be managed. So I definitely think it gave the younger athletes a year to mature and, and improve. I know like watching our freshmen and our sophomore added more strength, um, got into the, into the systematic approach of things and were able to get some more routine down and learn themselves a little bit better, gain some awareness. And ultimately that's going to hopefully, hopefully lead to better performances, but, you know, strength development of a 17 year old coming into college versus an 18 year old with one year of college in them. I think everyone at the end of the year would say they're a lot stronger and a lot fitter. Um, and idea, ideally those combined to be a better athlete and swimmer overall. So in that regards, yeah, I think that is pretty, pretty substantial uh, grounds for, for why the team was as young as it was. And just a testament to how good swimming programs across the country, like the Mesa Manta Rays, uh, Dynamo, Carmel, Sarasota, how dominant they are and how high information and quality and quantity they have that they're giving their athletes now. Like that's just phenomenal. Those are phenomenal facilities to, to be training at. I, uh, I was lucky enough that I got to go and visit the Sandpipers in Nevada earlier this year. And it's amazing some of the things that they're doing there. I watched a guy do 3100s freestyle in the minute. It was terrifying because he held like 56s the whole way. <laughs> so it's, it's just awesome to see. It's like, I, I think as you put it, a double-edged sword. Because it's awesome to see these younger athletes developing and achieving great things. But you also kind of feel for some of the older athletes or some of the seniors in college who maybe lost out on their shot. So this double-edged sword is definitely a good way to put it. Um, so at Pac-12s this year, which, <coughs> is for, first of all, ASU got third at Pac-12s, which is awesome. Yeah. Like the highest team finish since the 90s. Um, you dropped a 130.2 to freestyle. It's a pretty awesome time. Thank you. Sixth fastest ever. So can you walk me through some of the training that you think led to that such an awesome result? And if you're comfortable sharing, like, what are your goals this upcoming season as a fifth year? As a excuse me, fifth fifth year senior, right? Um, I, I wish it was fifth year. It's actually a sixth year technically, but uh, well. We'll, eligibility we'll, wise we'll, yeah we'll ignore that we'll ignore <laughs> the reality but uh but yeah no absolutely um you know i like i mentioned i, I started training with coach herbie bame uh in uh 2020 of june uh or january 2020 and then kind of since then i've stuck with him you know we for a little bit we did like an 80 percent herbie 20 15 percent bob um leading up into trials um but then in the fall this past year or I were actually at a finally a full year with uh, Herbie, um, being trained under Herbie. Uh, I just started training exclusively with him and his program. Um, and I think it's a testament to just like, uh, for, for me, like I, I just really thrive off of high intensity, high energy, technique focus, detail focus. And uh, sometimes I just kind of get, I, I get lost. And sometimes when we go higher qu quantity um, and more volume, uh, and I just kind of, my body just breaks down a little bit more. It seems like, um, I'm always willing to do it. I think Bob, Bob always, always says that to anyone. He's like, if I need, if I need Grant to do eight, eight hundreds, he'll do it. Like, <laughs> like he'll do it. And I, I will, um, cause that's just like the type of athlete I am. And I have full faith and trust in all the coaches that I've, that I've been with. And if I don't, I speak up. And if I didn't hear, I wouldn't be here. Um, but I trust both of them, um, completely and wholeheartedly. And I think just like that commitment to each day um, coming in, Herbie has a plan, you know, um, Monday being this this exact focus, kind of more higher extended, long, longer sustained efforts, um, Tuesday being more technical and uh, like a higher, higher technique and I am focus, Wednesdays being more max speed, the highest power output you can do over a shorter amount of time, Thursday recovery, 
uh, Friday, some more max speed. And then um, Saturday is typically like a suited effort or high intensity, you know, repeat efforts, 50 strokes, 75 strokes, 100 strokes. Um, and I think just that those marginal improvements without overdoing the, the body um, week in, week out really let me improve every single week in every single uh, every single practice and set. And so I was able to see that, feel that, and it was just a lot better. And so a lot of the sets we would do um, would be, you know, some of my favorite sets would be like repeat 50s um, on various time intervals. So we might start the season at like four minutes um, and then go down to two minutes and then start to build some volume. Uh, and I, I tend to do really well with that. Um, Monday afternoons are kind of like my, my, I don't know. I, I really like them. Um, they're just like a, a suffer fest, kind of a pain train <laughs> day. Um, uh, not many of the sprint group likes it. Um, but I like it cause it's like right on that fine line of I'm going to completely fail and I could sustain this for quite a, like a, a good amount of time. It's like that 85% effort, that, like aerobic threshold. Yeah, yeah, where it's like almost dipping into like going max speed, but you just have to walk a fine wire. That's how my coach in high school always told me. Um, like 200 strokes, 200 work is always like being on a tightrope. Is if you make the wrong move to the left, you're gonna fall off. If you make the wrong move to the right, you're also gonna fall off. And so you have to find that area. And for me, working with Herbie, that's like kind of where I've been able to find that that median and that middle ground and. Um, just the ability to race more often at a higher intensity, I think is <clears throat> what's ultimately led me to, to getting to that moment. Um, you know, when I, when I stepped up to the blocks at pac 12s, we had done weeks prior, we had done different efforts leading up into that. Um, I think a week before I'd done like a, normally I'll do like a 150 effort of a stroke and I did a freestyle and, um, it was like under under the world record, under uh, whatever I was at the time. He just gave me a time and he said, let's uh, see how fast we can beat this by. And I just say, okay. And I go and do my best effort I can. And uh, it's just like the confidence and the belief in that and just the routine, you know. When we're doing that four weeks before Pac-12s, I get to Pac-12s and I'm like, well, okay, this is just, I've done everything I can to prepare for this. This is just another situation in a different environment that I've already encountered and I think that's ultimately why I was prepared. You you must have been under a minute on that 150 then. I uh, <clears throat> um, I don't exactly. Because if you, if you were pacing for, if you, if you were ahead of the 129, because I think Dean Ferris has got the fastest time 129.1. One, you you must have been pacing like under a minute or right on a minute. That's pretty fast. <laughs> um. Well, I don't think it was under a minute because then I would assume that my last fifty was a twenty nine or a oh, thirty. Yeah, huh. Um. So I think it was like right around a one hundred five or one hundred six. Oh, um. Somewhere around there. Um. But that's also like you know going to a hand touch. Yeah. And um. You know. Pref- oh, my I, math was way off. But... And uh. And doing stuff like that. You know, like there's days too where we. We would suit up a lot, and I love that. I think that's that's just – I've never done it as much as I do with Herbie. Um, so I always get excited for that, whether I'm tired or not. And, I mean, there'd be days like – I know there's a little, like, competition that went on earlier this last year where Herbie put out a video of Ryan Held doing a 75 off the block. I remember was, that. Yeah, which, which was, like, fast. Um, it, it was solid. Uh, but there was, like, a day that we were doing uh, 75s and the guy, we were all like kind of talking, chirping at each other. And I think I was like, I was slated to go fourth out of five heats. And uh, it was just kind of like, you get in, go uh, on this like time interval. It's like Grant's going at 44 to 45. And then everyone else is doing their own thing too. Um, and I was just like, I think I pushed a, at that time, it was like 30.7, 75. Um, and it was just stuff like that that we were able to like step back and be like, all right, like we're we're moving we're moving in the right direction here. Like this is something I've never done before. These are pretty good accomplishments, and just getting confidence and faith from that preparation to know like when any moment arises that I'm ready and that I know I can do it. Because Herbie's a big believer in like if you're gonna swim fast on Monday, 
you there's no reason why you can't swim as fast or faster on friday or if you're going to swim fast on tuesday it's just another day like you need to be prepared to swim fast whenever you're called upon it um because that's kind of how our sport works in different ways so it was really like the 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 gradual and the marginal improvement and layering on layering of week after week after week that was a testament to what it was because um this past year i got sick quite a few times actually um unexpectedly so it was uh it was definitely a, a different mental approach to you know get back into training and just kind of get back to the process each time of okay where am i at how do i get better where am i at how do i get better from here and just keep that approach week to week and that's i think why i ended up where i was at pac 12s and ncaa's and and where i'm at today after the summer so speaking of the summer um you got you you got the pretty awesome opportunity to go down to australia and swim with team usa and Firstly, I'm interested if you can walk me through, just walk me through that three-day meet and all the different things that happened. And also, I'm interested if you can talk about the immediate reaction amongst, like, a small but unfortunately vocal minority of swimming fans was that the U.S. was sending their so-called B-team down to Australia, and then, you know, you guys proved, proved those people wrong. So I'm curious if you can talk about both the experience being at the meet and whether or not some of the things that people said, I mean, I, I, I doubt it affected anybody, but whether it was on your mind. Yeah, you know, I, uh, it, it's interesting. The, the meet was such a phenomenal opportunity that USA Swimming and uh, Swimming Australia were able to put on, um, you know, having not had the event in seven years. Um, it was pretty, <clears throat> pretty unique to be able to be a part of that first team to bring it back and um, with how successful it seemed to go as an athlete and, and amongst between Team USA and Team Australia, I really hope that it goes, it, it continues to be a strong entity going forward because I think it's a great opportunity for so many members of, this, of, of the team that got their first exper experience um, at an international team event, the relationships that formed from it, um, and just the unique dynamic that it brought. I think that they did a great job of providing an entertaining factor with all the different, like, uh, all the different like penal I guess not penalties, but like different modalities or modes or game gamification they had with it. Um, from the relays to the broken swims to the skins, like they really incorporated all of what swimming is trying to build towards and making it more exciting and more entertaining. And so I really appreciated that. Um, it was very fun, very entertaining atmosphere, uh, very different and refreshing as an athlete to go through that. Um, obviously most of the meets are all the same. I find dual meets, um, pretty entertaining, like once we're in, in them, um, and just like the, the fast pace of them and then just performing like kind of time after time after again, after like within 20 minutes or so. And I think the people who've done the ISL and gone through college have like an exponential, um, advantage over anyone who maybe hadn't, or like hadn't leaned into that as much as they had before. Um, and so it was just a great opportunity for that. And uh, I mean, I I don't really like since like 2019, 2020, I don't um, pay attention to like much of the commentary that goes on, like the article that you brought up. I really hadn't even known it existed other than a couple comments and uh, practice the next day. Um, but I just like choose not to, to really look into that anymore, like psych sheets. I, I honestly rarely even look at Psych Sheiks anymore because it's just like, it's a name on a, on a paper. Uh, I know I'm going to be at the meet or I'm not, like prior to the meet, like that's if my <laughs> times are good enough or not. And it really doesn't have any implication on going into it. So I, uh, I don't know if the talk was mainly from people within the United States or not. Um, if it was, that, that's interesting. But uh, I know we saw some comments from like Swimming Australia, some banter back and forth about like, I, did, I, I think B-level would, would have been a, a step up. I, I saw, <laughs> the only one I saw was C finalists coming in. So um, I thought it was I thought it was pretty interesting that, uh, I mean, America just, like, bodied them in the meet, but especially on the men's side. Um, I mean, we went 1, 2, 3 in the 200. We went 1, 2 in the 50 skins. Um, we went one, three in the hundred and we didn't even have put a third person in there. 
Um, and then we won the four by one free relay. So I, I mean, I can keep going, but <laughs> like, it's just interesting. But I think the sport of swimming needs that. I also think the sport of swimming needs that. And that might be an unpopular uh, opinion, but it needs that kind of back and forth that like kind of in heightened intensity and not just this neutral monotone, um, emotion throughout of it i think it needs the liveliness i think it needs the excitement um some of the banter and i I know i'm probably a minority in that in that case probably but i like to keep things a little bit lively entertaining i'm normally the guy talking in practice a lot and engaging with people and hollering and whatnot but i think that's what makes it exciting like you don't see us go to duel in the pool and all of us swim a thousand like a thousand per time like they don't even show the whole mile at the olympics like (laughs) Like they take a commercial break, like nothing to bash the mile swimmers, but it's just like the excitement is in certain aspects of swimming. And I think doing the pool really brought that out. And I think in, in all areas of it, you know, with the engagement, meeting the athletes, meeting the crowd, spectators, the two, two of the most powerful countries in swimming the world's ever known. And so a really neat event to get to do that um, with, you know, 12, I think it's 12 men and 12 women. Um, you know, a smaller, more intimate group got to really build some friendships, meet new people and, uh, form a lot of friendships with people that I, I knew of, um, but I didn't know. And that was what was really exciting, exciting to do is I got to, to befriend and meet a lot more people. And and that'll hopefully be, you know, through the, the rest of my swimming career, I still stay in touch with them. Um, and uh, and that and that that's one of the greatest things that Team USA gives us is the relationships along the way. So, the uh, the banter before I appreciate it when it comes up every now and then. I don't pay too much attention to it, um, but the the meet as a whole culminated like all these aspects that I think swimming is trying to do very well. I um you you were talking about the some of the news articles in Australia and. I'm thinking back to, I was interviewing Caitlin Sandino earlier, and she was talking about how, like, when she went to the Sydney Olympics, how popular swimming was, is, is there? And I'm remembering there's, in Australia, there's tabloids for swim, for, like, their Olympians in swimming. Okay. It's just, it's just kind of, it's just tr- triggered that memory of, like, how popular it is there that they've got, whereas in the U.S. we've got tabloids for, like, movie stars and various people there they've got tabloids for like their olympians and swimming oh yeah um, i mean you see like you see advertisements for like doing the yeah. pool day and then people would come up to us and like take videos and like take pictures with us and i was like this i mean you feel like a rock star down in australia it was awesome i was like this is so cool how much they commit to it and i mean that was one of the biggest arenas i've been in that wasn't like modified you know like olympic trials was it was at the arena. it was at like the sydney 2000 pool right Yep, the Sydney Olympic Park, which was on, uh, another level of, of surreal aspects. That was just such such an opportunity and so so much gratitude to be able to perform in that facility with so much history. Um, you know, Coach Salo and and, uh, and our team captain Aaron Pearsall. You know, both being there in 2000 and then coming back with our group uh, 22 years later to to do that. Like, what an opportunity! What a gift! Um, but yeah, all the fans, the stands were packed every day. The the excitement, the energy was electric. It was really neat to see how much they care and care for, um, care for like the, the swimming environment and the community and the athletes there. So um, I, honestly, it just sounds it just sounds amazing. Like, you're, especially being able to go back there with people who were there twenty years ago, much less having a team captain who'd been there and won a medal, just sounds fantastic. Um, so my last question for you for today. And as, as much as you're comfortable sharing, what do, what do you hope to accomplish within this next Olympic cycle? And after your time in the sport is finished, whether it be after this Olympic cycle, after the next one, or whenever, what, what do you hope to do after that? What do you see yourself doing once your time in swimming competitive, competitively at least is over? Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a profound question. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I definitely have some ideas uh, as to where I, where I want to go with, uh, with my career and my life. You know, being a, being a part of ASU um, in, in Tempe, Arizona has given me so many opportunities that I, I'll never know if I w- would have gotten elsewhere. 
Um, I never know if I'll have the same opportunities elsewhere or not. And uh, this is the path I chose, so this is the only reality I, I do know. Um, but because of that, you know, my undergraduate and, and uh, clinical exercise science, um, I definitely have a, a, a strong draw to training, coaching, um, pushing human performance to its highest levels. Um, and that's ultimately what I aspire to do with myself, with uh, my teammates around me. Um, for better or for worse, some days they might not like it. They might they might enjoy it. Um, but it is uh, just seeing how far we can push ourselves on a daily basis, whether that's mentally, emotionally, physically. Um, the day to day brings about nuances in each individual and in special way. And um, if I can be a part of that process in any way, whether it's strength and conditioning, that's been my passion for a long time, um, especially in the swimming realm, because I think that's been undermined and underutilized, which is a growing growing difference now i think it's being more appreciated and more focused on too um but just like a performance specialist of some sorts to help elevate our standard of wellness life and uh, ultimately performance in the sport is what i'm really drawn to especially in the olympic sports um a big uh, one of the biggest mentors in my life is keenan robinson um and the work that he does with so many different athletes um the care and the support um and also just the overall overall being that he exudes on for team usa but also in his career with the athletes he's worked with um i don't think you can i don't think there's a single athlete that i've ever met that doesn't have a, a phenomenal word to say about uh keenan um you know he is the head of the usopc strength and conditioning and does a phenomenal job with that and also goes on team usa trips as well and he was at doing the pool with us too um but a role, a role like that is very uh, aspirational for me. Um, I'm actually in a graduate program right now on kind of like a different path from exercise science, sports law and business um, to kind of correlate with my one year of eligibility. Um, it was a different lens I wanted to do uh, with the field of name, image and likeness and NIL and, and college athletics opening up. It's really intriguing to me. I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very excited about it. For athletes, um, I think especially my peers, because as the athletes last year probably didn't really benefit too much from it, athletes this year are kind of finally starting to benefit from it. And moving forward, I think that'll only exponentially improve, improve, improve. And that's kind of why I support it and I want to be a part of it and, and help the next generation, my the underclassmen, the next my peers at ASU improve and benefit from it. And that's my whole alignment with it. And if, and go, go again, it goes into, you know, just helping maximize this life that we get to have. And so it's kind of like two roles I've identified, you know, it's like I'm in the physical, the, the direct component of it. And then I'm also learning another side to it. I've, I've learned, I know what the athlete side of things is. I've had some experience coaching, um, both just as uh, private lessons, internships at Exos here at ASU that I, I, I got through um, out in Phoenix, a phenomenal opportunity working with the world's greatest athletes, like people starting in the MLB, pitchers, outfielders, um, starting on in, in the NFL, watching them on Sundays. Like I got to train them. I got to coach them. I got to learn from the best people that are helping them evolve and be better. Um and that's definitely where I'm like drawn to is coaching and making people uh, perform better in, in somewhere. Uh, another big mentor of mine is Scott Goodpasture in Cincinnati at uh, Cincinnati Functional Fitness. So big shout out to CFF. Um, but he always wants me to come work, come back and work for him. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe we'll expand something on on that regard. But um, he's always a mentor. He's kind of my first exposure into what strength and conditioning can do for an athlete and how much it can benefit them, not just on the physical front, but you know, as, as a mentor, as a coach, as a friend, as a confidant. And that's what I view Scott as, as now at this point, um, not when I started always, but it's, it's like the friendship and the relationship that we form through that, through the, the training sessions and outside too. Um, I'm very grateful and, and always, uh, and he's also in a position that I aspire to where he's impacting lives, I guess would be a general way of saying all this. Um, but that's kind of where I see myself kind of going. Um, for the first time in my life, I've kind of considered myself, you know, looking at 2028 um, Olympics. Uh, growing up, I thought it would always be a surreal opportunity to represent your country uh, at the Olympics in your own country. Um, very few get to do that. You know, uh, it's pretty it's pretty unique to get to see someone like Leon um, going through that now. 
um, with the opportunity to represent his country in Paris if everything goes well. You know, it's never a given. Um, he's in a great position to do that, obviously, now. And uh, But that would be a phenomenal opportunity when it, and when it does and when it does happen um, because I, I have complete faith and belief in him. And you just can tell the excitement whenever, whenever that idea pops in. And so to continue my career to then, I think is like more possible, more feasible now as I'm improving more and more this last year, I haven't more, the most improvement in my life than ever before in swimming. And, um, you know, with the, with the, with Herbie as well, it's been kind of more rejuvenating, uh, especially like this trip to Australia. Uh, I came back feeling like rejuvenated, re-energized, refreshed. It was the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. I didn't want to leave. Um, it was just amazing. And I came back feeling like years younger, um, years more refreshed. Uh, and normally after meets, I'm pretty crushed, pretty, pretty tired and need a time to reflect and, and, re and repair. But this time I came back pretty ready to go um, and pretty excited and, and optimistic about the future. And so definitely leading into 2024 is the immediate future. Um, Bob always says we can only really try to plan a year out. So just taking it year by year. Um, and a general plan, and then most importantly, day by day is really what I've learned to kind of focus in on and trust trusting the process there. But for that, for that like Olympic cycle cycle kind of plan, it's you know pressing on to 2024, and then onward to after that, a, a kind of see where things are at, see where I'm at in my life, see where things are at. Maybe maybe something opens up at ASU. Who knows? Maybe I can help. The program on that front i've always i've been having that idea a lot in the last year of like kind of staying here and really maximizing all the potential we can out of this program because i have a, just a strong affinity out here i love the community i love everyone that's out here and um it's just a real real aspect of gratitude and, and thankfulness to to everyone that's out here and i always try to give that back as much as i can and i feel like as an athlete i can do it in its own unique way um and then as a coach you have another layer and opportunity to give back in a different way. So we'll see what presents itself. I'll perform the best of my abilities this, this year to help the team as best I can and just be a, a great leader. Um, I have my goals and aspirations. I, I really share that with very few and selected individuals. Um, I think it's better to, you know, keep those, uh, approach those methodically, address them at the start of, of journeys. Uh, tell the people that you need to that will help get you there and that is most important to get you there and there, no one else really needs to know it's it's not my obligation to let anyone else know or my responsibility it's a good mentality um, to have yeah and i appreciate that and and uh, it's not always how i how it would be i used to plaster my my times up on my wall write them everywhere tell people hold me accountable but you know <clears throat> at the end of the day you're the one that knows if you're going 100% or 60%, regardless of what the clock says. And, uh, you know, you're the only one who knows exactly what you're going through every day. So it's just uh, holding myself accountable to those and the people that I've, uh, I've trusted and that, that I love and care about and know will support me and help me move to better places, knowing those and, um, you know, ultimately trying to accomplish something that Swimmers or humans have never, ever, never done before. Um, that's a very general answer, but a, a big goal of mine. So um, just trying to push myself to the, the limits of what I can do or I perceive or what humans perceive as possible is, is kind of my ultimate goal with human performance. And right now, human performance for me is in the realm of swimming. So to do what swimming has not done before. I, I think it's awesome to hear that you've, You've got the focus on the now on what you're doing now, but you've also got the, I like I don't know I don't know the opposite of hindsight is, but you've got the vision to see like, okay, eventually I'm not going to be in the sport, and here's what I want to do after. Um, so before we before we go, if you've got anything you want to promote, whether it's just like your Instagram or a sponsor, it can be whatever you want. I I let Caitlin Sandino before pr promoted just being kind. So it's whatever, this is your time, whatever you want to promote, you, it's all you. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it. Um, my social media platforms, I'm on Instagram, uh, Instagram at Mitochondria House, uh, Twitter at House the Mouse, uh, TikTok at Mitochondria House. <laughs> so that one I begrudgingly say, but um, it helps out with stuff. So 
if you're interested in any of my day-to-day belongings or some of the aspects that I like to harp on, um, can check those out. I normally, it's normally going to be fitness, some comedy, uh, nutrition. I'll have them in the description of the video. Yeah, yeah, nutrition, comedy, stuff of that nature. Um, two of my sponsors, I, I'm fortunate enough to uh, give them the opportunity to work with uh, Tier. Uh, and so big shout out to Team Tier for for their support in me. I've got Erica my Tier bag in the corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome to, awesome to see, awesome to hear. Um, Erica Vine at Wellness, uh, she's kind of definitely reshaped my perspective on wellness or mental wellness and uh, how I view health and optimization in the last year and working with her has been phenomenal. Um, and, uh, one of my friends, uh, down in Tennessee, Jake Heidecker, he works with a film production company for some up and coming music artists, jelly house productions. Um, so it kind of works well. He brings the jelly. I bring the house and, uh, <laughs> just works well. I've known him since I was eight years old, six years old in Indiana swimming and, uh, just a great guy. So there's, a. Uh, in my bio and my Instagram, uh, there's a link to all uh, a couple more of my sponsors uh, and some of the products that I use as well. Uh, it's in a link tree. You want to go check that out. Uh, there's some links to some discounts, some referral codes. And uh, yeah, just grateful for all the sponsors that helped me along this way.